So I want to talk a little bit about the history. I think most all of us know these uh, lakes were developed uh, back in the late 60s and 70s, and these lakes are impoundment. And so back then, uh, they, uh, the, the feeders to our lakes were the 14 Mile uh, Creek uh, and also Spring Branch Creek. Spring Branch Creek, according to old DNR records, was a 25% influencer, and then three fourths of our water came from 14 Mile. With the, uh, the advance of uh, agriculture upstream from us, uh, we don't get much out of the uh, Spring Branch Creek, so most all of our water now comes from the 14 Mile watershed. So, in 1979, uh, the University of Wisconsin did a study. And in that study, they tried to predict uh, the, the growth of agriculture and also the growth of residences around our, our, our lakes. And what they predicted is that we were going to see problems uh, with nitrates and with phosphorus. Primarily, the issue at that time was phosphorus. And uh, so, they, uh, they talked about the, the growth of, of properties. Back in 1979, um, I wasn't up here yet, but I think some of you probably were. There weren't nearly the number of houses around the lakes that there are today. So anyhow, they predicted that we would have problems. Nothing was done back then. Uh, 2002, another study was done, and it confirmed what the 1979 study told us, that we were facing issues uh, as agriculture, uh, continued expanding upstream from us, and also as more and more properties and residences were built along the lakes. And I think um, the last time there were about 1,800 properties uh, ringing along the three lakes here in Rome. So in 2014, uh, Lake Sherwood and Lake Arrowhead uh, were put on the state's impaired list, and they were put on the impaired list because of a uh, high algae buildup in the lakes. So nothing was done at that time. In uh, 2016, about this time of year, uh, we started experiencing blue-green algae. And how many of you have seen it in the lakes or experienced it? Um, well, uh, that really uh, it kind of turned the light on for a lot of us. And uh, pets died, and people were sickened. And um, you know, since then we've become a little smarter about using the lakes when we see uh, evidence of uh, blue-green algae buildup. But uh, a couple of us made a motion at the annual Tri Lakes meeting in 2016, and we asked for funding and also um, the ability to create a citizen committee uh, to start addressing the issues. And so the committee was made up of a couple of members from each of our, our lakes and uh, also uh, advisors from the DNR in Florence County. So uh, the new town board came in and they said, let's make this townwide because we also deal with like the wall and a lot of uh, streams uh, and groundwater. So our initial impact was to really deal with what we could control here on our impact on our lakes. And it was done under advisement from our DNR and Adams County people that said what you need to do is you need to provide credible evidence to the uh, agriculture community that you're serious and aware uh, that you're a part of the community. So, um, and we did that. And uh, so we, uh, we've done soil testing, we've done water testing, we've worked with the town of Rome to uh, put more teeth into the fertilizer program, uh, utilizing setbacks and reducing the amount of fertilizer to a reasonable amount. And the other thing we did is we started a test program with uh, turbines, and you may have seen it outside uh, when you walked in. And the, uh, this is a, it's a temporary fix, it's a band-aid solution, but it gives aid to those of you who live in bays where there is a heavy concentration of algae. And so it's proven that those things work. We run through the two-year experiment, and so we're about to shut that down, but I think the evidence is good that as a temporary measure, uh, it can provide some benefit. So um, the other thing we did is, uh, if you've been to the exhibits or if you look at this uh, sign, we created a clean water cooperator program. And so we asked that people abide by the fertilizer restrictions, uh, sign a document that says, yeah, we'll follow them, and then put this up so that you can communicate to other people around our lakes community that you believe in keeping the water clean. So uh, the other thing that happened was in 2017 then, um, our Adams County advisor suggested that we apply for an EPA uh, grant, a program called the Nine Element Program. And so we've done that, 
Um, and uh, approval expect is expected in July. And uh, it is the first in, uh, in the state to combine both groundwater and surface water. And our experts tell us that both are, are combined, or uh, uh, surface water relates directly to groundwater. It combines all 50 plus stakeholders in our 38 mile long watershed and it provides access to funding and expert resources. So my time is up. Uh, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, first, Scott Provost from the DNR. Stand up, Scott. I saw you back here. Okay. Um, he's our, uh, one of our advisors. He's going to talk about lakes biology, what's going on with our water right now, and some of the key issues. And then Patrick Goggins uh, from the UW Extension is an expert in shoreline and other uh, habitat and that impact on uh, on our lakes. And then Andrew Craig uh, is the DNR specialist who's in charge of uh, managing the nine kilometer process uh, application and also uh, mustering that along to the EPA. He couldn't be here today, and uh, so I'm going to take his place and uh, not speak as well as he, he is, but I will try to communicate what the nine kilometer plan is about. And then Scott Krug, who is our, uh, our state assemblyman over here, it's going to talk about uh, what the legislature can do and uh, how local government can help us in this uh, uh, program. So um, we expect to have lunch at about 12.30, maybe a little late, later because I've been verbose, but um, we'll have lunch at 12.30 and our guest uh, speakers have indicated that they'll take um, uh, questions uh, during the lunch period. So uh, feel free to ask them questions, uh, direct back and have a look at our exhibitors. Uh, there are a couple of exhibitors where if you go to see them, uh, you'll get an additional ticket for the drawing. So uh, with that, uh, welcome. Uh, Thank you all for coming, and let me introduce Scott Provost. Thank you all for coming. It's a great day out there. It's hard to get this kind of turnout with nice weather. Um, so I appreciate you coming in on the weekend for this. Uh, I just got back from Canada last night, so I've got a little bit of a walleye hangover. So, I, you know, I'm just going to try and stay focused here. If I start going off down, just give me a kicker. So, uh, here's our panel. Good deal. All right. Okay, thank you. So, let's talk about the 14 Mile Creek watershed, okay? You can't talk about the tri lakes without talking about the watershed. You want all your water quality starts out with the watershed first. If you want to manage water quality, you got to manage the land. It's that simple. So let's talk about the major sources of the nutrients we all know of, right? If we think of the easy stuff, there's upstream land use, our yards, our septic systems. Um, but there's these other weird things like internal loading. What does that mean? That's that stuff that's buried in the sediment that just keeps cycling around like this. That leads to a lot of problems over, the time, over time, and it takes the longest to flush out. So how you got to do this is you got to limit what's coming in to reduce the supply that keeps, because this stuff recirculates, some leaves the lake, goes downstream to Arrowhead, and ultimately it's gone to the river. But over time, if you, if you cut off the supply, you're going to ultimately decrease your internal loading. So that's important. That's a big factor with tri lakes, stuff that's it's residual, it's in the sediment, it's in the muck. Dredging, it's not going to get out. You're going to get rid of some of the dredging, but it's not feasible. It's just too much of it out there. So uh, the only best way to do it is deplete the source coming in and then let this run its course. So here's your watershed. This is your little lakes down here. This way, when you think us lake folks, just think about this right here. You don't understand it. Our watershed goes all the way to the east side of I-39, past Plainfield, all the way up to Hancock. All that land, all that water out there that falls on the ground, drains through the streams, drains through the lateral ditches, and ends up right here. That's a lot of land. That's a lot of stuff draining in. On a natural lake, you might see maybe a little spot like this, a little, maybe a little fraction of your watershed. If you've got such a big watershed, you're naturally going to have more nutrients coming in. It's by nature that you can't get around that. <clears throat> so, what, and what affects the land use, or what affects your water quality, as I said before, is land use. So what's changed? In 1979, about 10% of the land use was 
residential. Here in 2017, about 9% of this, some of the, you lost some residential areas up in the watershed that some smaller farms that were, you know, that are gone now. Um, agriculture is 46%, it's 51, it's not that big of an increase. And then, uh, look, there's, so if you look at these numbers, you know, there's not much change there. What caused it? You know, so the difference here is this and this. Both of these right here. Residential, it may be more yards going in, more fertilizer, more septic systems. The agriculture may change to more uh, like uh, vegetable growing instead of grazing and things like that. Small farms, you have more commercial fertilizers being applied. That's the commercial fertilizers are manufactured for like ammonium nitrate instead of new, new with the natural uh, fertilizer, slowly releases nitrogen. But uh, most your egg uses more cheaper forms of inorganic or commercial fertilizers. So what we do, what us uh, water geeks do on our day job is we play with these numbers and try to figure out how do we decrease the nutrients in the water coming in. So we got these little programs with clever names like Presto. That's actually just an acronym. Don't ask me what it means because I don't remember anymore. Um, but when we look at this, you can see you, you can't see it probably from there, but the, the land cover hasn't changed much. But we do know what the, that the, what, how much agriculture contributes to our uh, tributaries or streams coming in. So uh, we know about 39% is coming in from the streams. Uh, and then other stuff is coming in from the shorelines, what type of streams they are, things like that. This is part of the model that helps us get to figure out where we manage, where we put our money. Where's the best, you know, we don't want to stick 90% of the money where 10% of the problems coming from, right? That doesn't make much sense. You wouldn't manage the business that way. You wouldn't manage, you don't do it the same. You, you, you adapt those same principles so you can do to increase efficiencies. That led us to this. In order to find out where you want to concentrate efforts, you got to figure out where it's the source they're coming from. You just can't say, oh, we're going to, Go up in the watershed and do this. Well, you, you just saw how big your watershed is. But you need to figure out where in that watershed concentrate efforts. So through a base of a whole bunch of monitors, citizen monitors, people like you have been going out and grabbing a ton of data. They're actually growing, grabbing flows using the same equipment that we have. Um, some of it's better than we are what we have. Uh, and it allows us not only to calculate the concentration, how much nitrogen or how much phosphorus is in the stream, but the mass, that's how many pounds, and how much, not just what the concentration is like. One part per million, what does that mean? I don't know. One part per million in a stream that goes 10 cubic feet per second isn't much. One part per million in a stream that comes in your lake at 50 uh, CFS or cubic feet per second is a lot more. So you need to know the mass. That's the amount, the physical amount, like a cube that's coming in a year. So, what, uh, uh, what some of our monitors like John and Jez, John and Prezzi, uh, affectionately known as Johnny Hot Rat, goes out and he monitors these sites with uh, another young man, and Rob Borsky has helped him over the time, over the years too. So we, we found some hot, well they found some hot spots. And this data, is, it's their data, it's not ours. Um, this is something that's funded by your group, right? You know, we're not playing a role here, we're just using this data. So you guys are providing this for us. And they found that, you know, if we're going to stick any money in the area, maybe this is where we want to concentrate, this is where a lot of the nutrients are coming from. When we look at, if I, we look at concentration, um, it's not going to tell us something, but we know that there's a 123 pounds per day of nitrogen coming in through these streams right here. That's the same stuff you put on yards to get grass to grow, right? It's also the same stuff that makes blue green algae, that fuels blue green algae. So it's important that we cut this out. But here's something important. Look over here. Here's Lake Camelot, 602 pounds per day. So that's what's coming into the, that's the lakes. That's coming out of the sediments too. So it's just not egg up there, folks. It's also the lake and the shorelines. So when you break it all down, at the end of the day, it's about 50 50. So if there's nobody in this room that can go up and point upstream and say, it's all you guys. There's nobody upstream that can point out so you can see that. It's, it's, it's both. 
There's people out there putting enough nitrogen under the yards out here. It's equivalent to having a thousand pound steer walking around and crapping on it all, all year long. <laughs> That's, so put that in your mind. Every yard out there having a thousand pound steer on it. That's a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus coming into the system. <coughs> Oops, sorry. All right, so it, it's just not phosphorus. Remember, everybody's heard about phosphorus, how important it is. It is a big deal on the Wisconsin River things where you've got all this huge, you know, now you're talking about watersheds, 21% of the state drains through right through here. That's even bigger. You got all that phosphorus coming in over time, you get these big algae blooms and things like that. But it's just not phosphorus anymore. It's also nitrogen, especially in the central sands where we have some of the highest nitrogen concentrations in the state in their surface water. Coming from commercial <clears throat> fertilizers, from septic systems, from yards, we have very coarse sand. You can get 10 inches of rain and grow cactus, right? It's just, we're lucky that way. They have growing soils. So we have to add a lot of stuff to it to get anything to grow. So we, that nitrogen ends up in our groundwater that goes to streams or to our drinking water well. So it's a function, it's just, if you, you can't apply the same type of applications you do in heavier soils to sand soils. The plants may be that, but it has adverse effects to our resources as well. So that nitrogen comes in, and you, you all heard about blue-green algae, if you live on the lake, you know what blue-green algae is. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, it's, a, it's found all, in all water bodies. It's, it's, it's a, a question of how much uh, blue-green algae is out there. A little bit is fine. We all, it's, it's, like I said, it's in every lake. But when you get those massive blooms where people are, kids are getting sick, or people are walking around, they're inhaling the, the uh, allergens, they think they got a cold or runny nose, but actually that's a, a response to the toxins you're breathing in, or somebody's dog dies because they drank it or they licked it, that's not cool. We shouldn't have to deal with that. And that's what, and it brings people out. And they get mad. And they say, what are you going to do about it? And I say, what are you going to do about it? Because it comes back to you. It comes back to everybody in here. So we all got to reduce what we're using. The thing with nitrogen, and this is, there's not a standard in Wisconsin for nitrogen. So you, know, you put as much as you want, basically, in it. So, but when it comes into the lake, blue-green algae can fix its own nitrogen. Take nitrogen, turn it into something they can use. But in order to produce those toxins that make your dog sick or your kid sick or whatever, or smells bad, that putrid smell, right, that you, you smell, those, it takes a ton of nitrogen to do that. It's very nitrogen expensive for blue-green algae to make those toxins. So the more nitrogen you got floating around out there, the more toxins a unit of blue-green algae can produce. So it's, you can't, you just can't think about phosphorus. So we all think we do a good job and we're using 2703 fertilizer, right? Because that zero number is P. We're not putting any phosphorus on. Guess what you're doing with the nitrogen? You're overloading it. It's going into the groundwater, into the lake. It's going to produce more blue-green algae toxin. Not just blue-green algae, but blue-green algae toxin. So here's what this blue-green algae stuff is. It's primitive <coughs> bacteria that has over, that has chlorophyll in it. So it's a bacterium that can produce its own food via sunlight. It's been around for a couple billion years. Some of it hasn't changed. There's three main species that we deal with out here in the trilates. There's Anabina, and Anaphanazanamon, and Microcystis. Us biologists call it Anaphany and Mike. That's the best way to remember the three types of blue and algae you got out there. All of these can produce toxins. Microcystis produces, that's the most prominent one, that produces microcystin. That's a toxin that gets most of the people sick. That's the stuff that likes nitrogen. The more you have, the more it can produce. So, it's, uh, you all see this, and guess what? Guess what it shows up? It shows up in the summertime, it's quiescent, it's nice and hot. That's the only thing that's missing. There's enough nitrogen phosphorus out there right now to start a bloom. So the idea, the only way to control that is to decrease the amount of nutrients coming in. I don't know if you heard that yet today. <laughs> I'm hoping you have said this enough that it, it, it sticks in your head here. You tell them what you told them, tell them again. That's what I have to do with my kids. They still don't listen. <laughs> so and the, the other problem with this, I don't have that picture, is this stuff floats around on the lake, and the big bay, or on the big lake, it's not as bad. 
But when the wind blows from the south or something, it socks it into a bay that goes to the north, and those little fingers, it has no place to go. It just more and more comes in there. When it gets dense, it gets dense. It's having a party, it's reproducing, it's, it's got everything it needs. And guess what happens? Those folks in those bays have everything's right there. Their septic systems, their long fur legs, their close to each other. You've got a major dose, it's not the moon, it's right there. Yeah, he's got a perfect storm. That's why these bays get socked in. So you go in, you know, I could go out there with some copper sulfate or some hydrogen peroxide, all the sides, and kill that. No problem. It's going to be back tomorrow if the wind blows. The other thing is when I kill that algae, and all those toxins that are in those cells right now that aren't released will release. Because all algae sites burst the cells, and it lysis out that toxin. Treating this the water will clear, it'll all fall on the bottom, but it'll be more toxic than it was before the algae was there. So treatment isn't really an option. So the only way you can do it is kind of push it back out, maybe with turbines or whatever. Well, what's the other way to control it? Yeah, that's right, cut the two sources off. All right, so what we got from our, all this provisional data that all these awesome uh, people out there sampling are, it has similar surface water, or watershed issues as other watersheds in Central Sand regions. The Four Mile, the, 14, the Ten Mile, the Four Mile, Rasha Cree all have the same issues. So the reason why you don't hear about Ten Mile is they don't have a reservoir system on it. Four Mile has Lake Rosicha and it has Lake Nepco. Ten Mile has nothing. Fourteen Mile has the Tri Lakes. Rasha Cree has Rasha Cree and Arkdale. So that's when you start seeing these, these things happening. Got to slow this water down, it gets hot, you get, get these systems. Thank you. Um, almost all the total nitrogen coming into the stream ex exceeds two milligrams per liter, two parts per million. Natural background level is less than that. So you're already above the natural background level. And we have that we have lit, uh, concentrations high as 12 to 15 parts per million or milligrams per liter. So you're oftentimes seven to eight times higher than what natural background is coming in. Or floating around all the water. Um, whoops. And most of what's unique about this system is your phosphorus that causes that usually causes most of the problems with water quality, like it does on peat loam and castle rock. It's not the culprit here. Your phosphorus is actually pretty low. So it, you got coming in, the water it is not that bad. The big character here is nitrogen. But we don't have a standard for nitrogen. But we got a man. We don't need a standard, right, folks? I don't. I don't need to put a speed limit sign on highway to tell you don't drive like a butthead. Keep it down. Don't drive and cause an accident, right? If you know something is needed, then do it. Why? We don't have to wait for a law. You don't have to. We can use ourselves. That, that works really well if you really believe it. Even if we put a law in here, you don't believe it, you're not. Gonna Bye bye anyway. So let's we don't need to wait. We can do this ourselves, despite how we practice everything. Um, we're we continue to isolate hot spots. And there, those original hot spots I showed you, they're starting to uh, zero in on them now and they're trying to find out exactly where the sources are. That information then we can go and to our, use it work with our county partners, or you can work with your county partners at Land and Water Conservation Department make contact these farms, or if there is an issue up there, and can we work with you on a project? Perhaps, perhaps we find a hot spot and we say, you got a lot of uh, it's ditched or whatever, what if we buy that land or we put in a wetland reserve program, convert it back to wetlands, and now it's no longer an under egg or something. That, that's one possibility. Or we go and we just put out a no, no fertilized ordinance, or you guys just practice no fertilized. Those are the things that we so one thing we did find out was very, very interesting with this uh, monitoring that was going on. Was the cranberry marsh is upstream. The nitrogen coming in is high, but when it leaves, it drops out or decreases. And they got these big reservoirs out there, right? And it's full of carbon. They're shallow. They're full of carbon. They will eat up that. That nitrogen denitrifies goes back in the atmosphere. That's what we're thinking. So we can't figure out right now, well, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, that that water, those collect cranberry bogs out there, the beds, not so much the beds, but the reservoirs, they're actually cleaning the water coming into you. So maybe that's something you do in an area that's too wet to farm or whatever, 
is we can work with them and, and do some wetland reserve program or, or, wet, or CRP or what they call uh, or pasture reserve program. We can still graze it, but you just convert to different land use. And it, it's, it's, that's federal money coming in for that. Is that paying so much up to uh, $3,200 an acre, I think, to take it out of production and you still own it? You know, so it, you know, there's things we can consider. So there's all kinds of options. You just got to keep, you got to think out of the box and maintain it. I'm not going to go too much in a non-key element plant, right? You are? Yeah. All I can tell you, it's one of the coolest non-key element plants that have been done because they include groundwater as a fan service water. Um, so I'm excited to see that. And that's it. I just got a nasty look from Goggins because I'm cutting into his time. <laughs> we were both lamenting a, one of our predecessors, Bob Sorge, who talked so long, take all the time up, and we didn't like, have no, we didn't have this time to present anything. I'm like, thanks for coming, Bob. <laughs> Sign around Don says. Uh, that's nice. You know, personally, I have waterfront property too, and I pay taxes on another one for my wife's property uh, on her family cottage. And uh, uh, when I come down here to relax and go fishing, the last thing I want to do is my wife asks me, Did you cut the grass? You know, and I tell her, the only time I walk on that grass is when I cut it. Well, I don't want it there. If you want it, you go cut it. It usually gets me in trouble. <laughs> All right, I, I, you want to... Oh, my uh, colleague from the past, Patrick Goggins. He's another guy along in the twos. I'm going to warn you right now. He's, uh, I'm half Irish. She's all Irish, so he's going to talk a lot longer. So, uh, but he's been doing the shoreland stuff. And this is one key, one good way to get rid of fertile lawn application. It's a great way to go. He's a good speaker. You can be entertained. And uh, he's loud. He probably won't need his microphone. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have a question and answering thing later, unless you're. Uh, too many. Thanks for having me here, guys and gals. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about lake shores, clean water, and healthy lakes. Um, and I work for UW Extension Lakes. I hope you've heard of us. Uh, Extension, the idea is that Wisconsin idea of trying to bring research, ideas, grant opportunities I'll talk about here today. Uh, just information for you as a community to come together and do good things for lakes. So, um, I'm going to roll through what a healthy lake shore looks like. I think as a starting point, it helps us all to understand characteristics uh, of what a healthy lake shore looks like and what attributes those characteristics give to the lake, how they help support the food chain and the things we love with lakes. Then I'm going to take you through uh, um, some of the changes, or I'll give you a quick view of the critters and plants that live in that area. But then we're going to go through some of the changes to lake country. That Scott's been uh, hinting at, and I'll take you through mostly that shoreland interface, that land water interface where we as property owners have uh, changed things a little bit and what that has meant for lakes. And then on a happy note, that isn't the end of the story. We'll talk about healthy lakes as part of our surface water grant program with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, uh, where we have funding to help you with five best practices that get after this nutrient challenge as well as. Um, providing more habitat for our, our lakes. And uh, as Don said, I'll stick around here all day, so uh, if you have a question, write it down and let's uh, talk in the lunch. This Wisconsin Lakes Partnership, how many of you have heard of this entity? Oh, I got a bunch of newbies in this room. So, all the partnership is, it's a 45-year-old partnership here in the state. And what it is, is it's UW Extension, Education's our gig, DNR, technical assistance, and that grant money, and then it's Wisconsin Lake Communities, 900 plus lake groups like the Tri-Lakes Group, the 14 Mile Group, uh, your individual lake groups, uh, Arrowhead, Sherwood, and who did I forget, Camelot, thank you, coming together as a public-private partnership to do good things for lakes, to try and leave them in a better place, to try and leave them healthier. One of the ways we communicate is Lake Tides, a newsletter that comes out quarterly, 
If you haven't heard of Lake Tides, this is a little sign-up sheet. Uh, Steve, if I would, I'm just going to start you off with that. Uh, if you don't get it and would like to get it, we'll send it to you electronically or hard copy. Uh, please sign up. Uh, and you can go to these websites to learn more, but just Google Extension Lakes to get connected to us. Okay? All right, let's start with that healthy lake shore and the attributes we see. Let's start out in the lake. And what we're going to talk through here is what are some of the values and functions that go with these different characteristics of a healthy lake shore. The first thing we often see, even in lakes like yours, I'm trying to get my pointer to work here, there it is, is tree stumps. What in the water? You know, even though you're not the oldest lake, you're a flowage, so you were created uh, probably a few decades ago through um, that flowage system. Wood, in forested areas like we live in here in Wisconsin, does what? It naturally falls over into lakes over time. It could be bugs. It could be that windstorm. It could be fire that rolls through it uh, prior to human settlement. But the idea is, wood was a, a big part of that near shore area, that so-called littoral zone. And then emergent vegetation, things like hard stem bulrush, those lily pads, uh, other aquatic vegetation in that near shore area, some of the functions that this wood in, 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 and uh, vegetation provides, it intercepts that wave action. It helps dampen the energy of that wave action as it hits shore. It also is a spawning ground for those baby fish that we come to the lake to try and catch. It also is the base of the food chain, the aquatic insects, the other organisms, uh, daphne and the like, that are growing in those areas and are the base for the whole food chain of the lake. The other thing we see on healthy lake shores is just wood lying next to the shore. It could be lateral like this log, but again, that's wildlife habitat. Where is that turtle going to go to get the sun and get those leeches to fall off? Where are those aquatic insects going to burrow into to uh, stay over time and so on? And it too provides erosion control by just absorbing wave action and absorbing energy from that ice when it hits it in winter time. Okay. Now let's move here to this land-water interface, probably the most important uh, function of that lakeshore system. And the thing, so the thing we want to see there are three tiers of vegetation. The canopy, you know, it might be those super white pines towering over the hard, uh, hardwoods underneath. And then underneath that canopy, small trees and shrubs, that shrub layer important to a whole bunch of birds, a whole group of animals and organisms that lives in this middle area. And then the ground layer, grasses, wildflowers, sedges, rushes, a whole suite of plants that come together with those deep penetrating roots to hold soil, but also provide that habitat for the critters we love on lakes. Some of those critters, there are those aquatic insects, things like the giant water bug and other food you see listed there. This is the food chain base that's supported through this healthy lake shore. Dragonflies, how many of you have started seeing them popping up? Everyone see the dragonfly has those horizontal wings. Conversely, here's our, oops, damselfly. You see how the wings on the damselfly hug the abdomen. They're more lined up with the abdomen. So here are some common bluets. What do you notice in these pictures, folks? It's not lawn that these animals are using. It's those sedges, those grasses, the vegetation that's so important for their life cycle. Damselflies, look at them, they're all on a hard step bulrush or a grass near the shore, right? Same with our frogs and toads, 11 species here in the state. Whether it's the little wood frog there in the bottom right corner living in that duck layer, that accumulated leaf and, and uh, organic matter on the forest floor, or some of these other water-loving frogs, they need that vegetation. Turtles, snapping turtles look out, they're on the roads right now trying to find that nice gravelly area to do their thing, but also the spiny and the painted turtle. Small fish, whether it's the sunfish and bluegill using that near shore area to create their nests, or perch using that vegetation to cling their eggs to uh, for the next generation. Whoops. The big fish. There's a couple fishermen who just got all pumped up for that musky this afternoon. All they got to do is see it. But these fish, too, uh, are cruising these near shore areas and doing their thing. Water birds. How many of you came to Lake Country because of things like eagles, ospreys, and loons, the call that loon across the water? 
Well, Loon, my friends, needs clean water. It's a sight fisherman. That Loon is looking for fish, and it's got to be able to see it. Well, when our water gets murky, filled with sediment from uh, too much uh, runoff carrying that dirty water, or those nutrients kick in and the blue-green algae comes, our loons are going to have trouble trying to find that fish. Same with these other water birds, they're going to be impacted. Small mammals, whether it's the beaver, that guy in the upper right is the star-nosed uh, uh, bull. That thing is a snorkel. It actually kicks it up into the uh, uh, above the water line, grabs a little air, and then it comes back down and can go for minutes at a time underwater. Even large mammals, I live up in Phelps, Wisconsin, look once in a while, we're lucky enough to get a moose. Uh, these are the gorgeous things that uh, are sustained through healthy uh, shoreline systems. But I got one more critter I want to talk about with you, and that's the human side of the equation here. How many of you, when you came to lake country, and maybe you still do, this looks familiar to you? A three season cabin, maybe 800 square feet. Uh, when you showed up, mom and dad said, yeah, you're sleeping out by the campfire, good luck to you. That was kind of the rhythm of things on Maps of Lake Country. And then starting probably in the 1950s and 60s, after the war, we get some affluence by that second home, that lake home dream that everyone has. And maybe we come along and build that retirement home. And we move from an 800 square foot structure to 4,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, which is fine unless that building goes unchecked, i.e. hard surfaces like those rooftops, the driveway, uh, start to add that nutrient that Scott was talking about. So this bottom left diagram, this is an undeveloped lot. The runoff is in blue, the green is phosphorus. You can think of nitrogen the same way, and, and red is sediment. Here's our three season cabin. About the same amount of runoff as the undeveloped lot, same amount of phosphorus, and a four times the amount of dirt sediment getting to the lake. So a little impact to the lake from that three season cabin, but not terribly changing the, uh, the, the picture. Look at the uh, far one though. This is our big 4,000 square foot unit. We have five times the runoff coming off it, six times the phosphorus, and 18 times as much dirt or sediment making into the water, covering that walleye habitat, bringing that nutrient that uh, Scott was talking about into the system. So that's the challenge, is when we move to those bigger uh, size developments, can we do the two big overarching goals? Trying to keep that dirty water from making its way into the lake and instead capturing it or diverting it to a safe place to infiltrate like a rain garden or your woods, and keeping that habitat, those three tiers of vegetation, some wood in the water, aquatic plants in that near shore area, the sustenance for lake life. You know, we've been studying this in Wisconsin for a while. In fact, we just reinforced uh, this work through National Lakes Assessment and Environmental Protection Agency study that in 2007, 2012, in 2017, looked at a subset of lakes all across the country. The number one stressor to lakes in Wisconsin, as well as uh, throughout the nation, is what we've been talking about. That first, that black uh, thing uh, identified up there, lakeshore habitat. Those three tiers of vegetation. We're pretty good about leaving the trees, but that shrub layer and that ground layer of sedges, rushes, and wildflowers becomes long, and it's not good for lake country. And we've been, like I say, studying this for a while. You know, here's an example there on the bottom of a lake where we have had wood falling in for centuries. We can see as many as 500, 600 pieces of wood per linear mile in lakes uh, with that kind of uh, wood fall to it. And so that's why uh, uh, we've seen changes to our lake. We've talked about the loss of water clarity. That second disc reading becomes shorter and shorter. Water gets pull that green, uh, blue-green algae, or just sediments in general, becomes harder uh, from a clarity point of view. We also see these nutrients build up and cause the al alpha blooms. These are the Madison lakes. We also see fisheries degradation. Fish are finding so much trouble trying to find that food chain that goes away when we take that wood out of the water, that instead of finding aquatic insects, 
or Daffy or things like that to eat, they're so desperate they start eating their own young. And they just don't grow as fast and they don't do as well. So fish suffer as well. But the good news is, like I say, we can do something about this as uh, property owners living on our waterways. And so really from a revegetation point of view and, and looking at shorelands, there's three ways we can go about this. We can, maybe we have a shoreland that looks like that first picture I had. You're in pretty good shape. I got some wood in the water. I have three tiers of vegetation. Got some hard stem bulrush out front. My job is just to keep it that way, the first number one up there. Protect that nice intact buffer. Maybe watch out for invasive species like purple loosestrife or reed canary grass. The second option, uh, to Scott's point uh, with his wife, is maybe just put the lawnmower away and just let that strip of land next to the lake start to grow back. And the sea bank naturally starts to produce and uh, that, that native vegetation returns. The challenge with that is you can't control so much what's showing up there. It's what's there, it's what's there, and, and you can't select maybe the species. So that brings us to the third option, accelerated recovery. And that's where we literally buy those trees, those shrubs, and those ground layers of grasses, sedges, and wildflowers, and we jumpstart our shoreline recovery by putting those plants in the ground. So I just want to talk you through, so it's trees, shrubs, and that ground cover, and maybe we're doing some erosion control work at the same time. So this is a group of birding club up in the North Woods, they had a big wind event that blew all the red pines down along the shore, and they're coming uh, along to restore that vegetation. And we're being successful with our work if we're slowing that water down, instead of it flying through the property, right into the lake, carrying that nutrient and sediment load, instead, we're, we're capturing that water, putting it into a rain garden, putting it into a diversion that sends it to the woods, some safe way of keeping that water from bringing dirty uh, nutrients and sediment to the lake. We're helping maybe with glacier erosion, and we're increasing the habitat at the site. And those layers of vegetation, one of the other important layers is that ground layer. You see the word dup up there, like Homer's beer, D-U-F-F. -F. It's the sponge of the forest, folks. It's where all that water goes. Instead of it flowing to the lake, it hits that spongy material of the forest floor, it again allows to infiltrate back into the ground. At the same time, it's filtering those nutrients out and filtering that sediment out that it's carrying. And so uh, the dump layer is very important, and so that accumulation of leaves and organic matter underneath those three tiers of vegetation is also part of the shoreline system. And again, we disturb that sometimes or rake it up, and we just don't have as healthy a situation then. The other thing is the root structures. So these native plants, they're, they're built for our climate, they're in tune with our insects and wildlife, but the other cool thing is they have these massive root systems. So up here on the left, here's Kentucky bluegrass, massive root system, full four inches deep. But look at those native plants, some get four, five, ten feet into the ground. And about a third of those roots die back every year such to leave those little waterways for that water that we're trying to get it to infiltrate to get back into the ground. So that's part of the reason we're utilizing those native plants, is those root structures both hold the soil and help with infiltration. And Doug goes into this. If you haven't heard of Doug's book, check it out, uh, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants in Your Own Front Yard or Backyard, as it were. Um, but Doug's a lepidopterist, and he studies insects. And just one humble oak tree, 557 species of moths and butterflies will utilize an oak tree. Another 60 birds will use an oak tree to cavity, as a cavity nesting uh, habitat. And, and then think about the mast of that acorn. Another 100 species probably use acorns just to, for their food. So if there's one species we might be thinking about for our restoration, oak trees might be it. But the other point of this is, how many have you heard of buckthorn? one of our invasive uh, understory shrub, uh, trees or small shrubs. 10 species of moss and butterflies. So again, just trying to drive the point home of why we go with these native species. They support the wildlife that we're trying to uh, encourage. And all those pollinators that are supported through that oak tree, they're helping your garden grow better, they're helping that cranberry marsh grow better, they're helping that potato grower 
uh, do better because those pollinators are out there being supported through these native plants. Doug spoke at our Lakes Convention. You can get that uh, archive at our website if you're interested and watch his talk that was taped. So let's get to these Healthy Lakes best practices. Can I get some helpers, Don, to pass out the uh, brochures and the native plant guide, please? So Don's going to pass out the Healthy Lakes brochure, which takes you through three zones. Again, you see our, our vegetation here. We have our tree canopy, shrub layer, grass sedge ground layer, and then we broke the lakeshore property into three zones. In lake, that's in the water. Transition zone, that's the 35 foot buffer zone. The land water interface where that buffer uh, uh, exists between land and water. And then basically upland is the rest of the property. Up beyond the 35 foot buffer to the whole rest of the property. We try to come up with five best practices to help you as landowners um, do good things to help with this clean water and wildlife habitat. And so let's take a look, starting in the water, it's fish sticks. Dave Trudeau can tell you all about how this works. His back is still sore from last uh, winter, I think. They put in a number of these on Sherwood. But what fish sticks are, I'm going to take you through each of these five best practices. Just to give you a sense, fish sticks in the water, native plantings at the shore, in that buffer area, diversion up on the driveway to divert water, or a rock infiltration pit if we don't have a safe place to send that water to, like the forest. We can use an infiltration area, basically a rock pit in the ground to put that water in. And then a tool called rain guards. How many of you have heard of rain guards? A few more of you have heard of that. So let's go through these. Fish sticks. This is what it looks like. Winter time. Hopefully there's better ice than this year, says Dave. But the idea is you drag three to five mature trees. We're talking 30, 40, 50 foot size trees on the back of a... Uh, um, flatbed or a skid steer, however you get them out there. You drag them to the site where you want to locate them. And then you, can, you put them perpendicular to shore in this cross configuration. Here's what they look like from the air. And then comes springtime. That ice melts. That wood wedges itself down into the lake bottom and you're off and running with your fish stick structure. They're tethered using a duckbill anchor system to an existing tree on shore. So that's what this is right here. It's using a duckbill system to keep that log in place. And that's about a year later. Much of the vegetation has fallen into the lake. Some people ask, aren't you worried about navigating through there? And the idea is this is Swallowdo Lake. So this is about 100 feet of water on the lake uh, shore often. And the idea is you know, we're just supposed to be putt putting through there anyway. And oftentimes, we see these aquatic plants return when those fish sticks are in the water. They just fly at the near shore area up and up to help that aquatic plant um, population do well, too. So here's what a site could look like that we're thinking about for fish sticks. This is just, I don't even know what lake this is, but you know, there's a little wood on each side and there's kind of a hole here. We could think about um, siting fish sticks there. For each one of these best practices to help you as a uh, get your head around it. We have uh, a one-page fact sheet that takes you through just kind of how you do the project, how much it costs, do I need a permit, and then there's a, what we call a companion guide. All this is on that Healthy Lakes website, which is the website right on the front of that brochure. And this is the fish sticks guide. It's about 20 pages long, and it basically what the technical guides try to do is coach you up as a landowner of how to put a good project together. So it takes you through how to site the uh, fish sticks with your uh, fish manager and to create a fish sticks project. The native plant guide, I see some of you have grabbed a copy of that, that same thing for that, that walks you through uh, doing the native plant. So let's go to that, 350 square feet. You open that guide, I think it's page three or four, you'll see what we did is created, oh, I, I think I took them out. There's six, six template options for you in there. So, uh, let me see there, yeah, let me borrow yours. Page four. If you look at page four, you'll see six options. Lakeshore edge, uh, bird butterfly, that's a set of plants that help pollinators. Bare soil, that's where I got an erosion problem or a challenge with uh, eroding soils. That's a suite of plants that help with that. Low growing, 
A lot of folks are concerned about maintaining that view corridor. So this is a suite of plants that none of those plants get above your knee, but at the same time I'm getting habitat, root structures, and the functions that we talked about. And then the last two, deer resistant. Notice it doesn't say deer proof. <laughs> Where I live, uh, I came home on St. Patty's Day weekend and 21 deer in my driveway. So I have metal around every single tree and shrub I put in the ground. But it is a challenge, uh, the deer. This is a group of species that are a little less favored by deer. I won't say that the deer won't eat them. If they're hungry, they eat plants. That's what they do. And then the fifth one is shade, or the last one is shade, woodland. The idea is maybe you have a mature oak, but you don't have anything underneath it. This is a suite of plants um, that works in shade. And then for each plant, we have uh, a picture done by one of our lake leaders. If you turn the page, you'll see uh, the lakeshore one, the first one. There's a diagram showing you how to lay the plants out in a strong way. And these planting lists follow the state standards. So each one of the lists has a woody component, one or two shrubs and one tree. It has a grass sedge and rush component. That's the green part of the list. Um, that's up our, I think it's green, yeah. That's the green part of the list. That's those sedges and grasses and rushes with those fibrous root systems that hold soil. And then the last component is wildflowers and the like. And where do you put these? Well, you fit them to the way you want them to fit on your property. So it could be a 10 by 35 uh, foot area. It could be 10 feet you know, along the shore here, and then we go 35 feet this way in a backward L. You could put just an 18 by 19 foot square here. You could put a, you know, a lid. it's got to be at least 10 feet wide, but you can shape it the way you need to to fit your property. So here's an example. I think this was a park on a lake I was at. You could just redo this buffer area. No one's really walking in there anyway. Um, and again, do a little restoration on the shoreline. And here's what it could look like. Here's an example of a healthy lakes planting over on Beaver Dam Lake by one of our um, early healthy lakes participants. So use this guide. There are those six planting options. Like I said, each one has this uh, layout of how the plants can look. And then the woody component, the grass component, and the wildflowers. And the idea is um, you have 15 different species here. The list's all ready for you. All you have to do is work with your local native plant supplier and get it, get it going. I'm just going to click through these. Quick. You get to the, so there's what it could look like. These, this house, they took out the rock riprap in the top here. They uh, replaced it with a native planting. And look at it. The bulrush returned within the same growing season. They had a thousand frogs in there in, in literally that same summer. Um, I don't know why they got rock in the first place. It doesn't really matter. I guess at this point, the idea is that native vegetation is doing good things now. Here's what that third practice, the diversion. I think of it as water bars. Think of it as speed bumps when you're going through school. The idea is you just have a little rise on that driveway. Instead of that dirty water making its way to the lake, we create a, put a timber down or a piece of hard rubber that you can drive over, or even just a bump, a rise in the road. And the idea is you divert that water safely to the woods. If you don't have a safe place, so here's what that can look like. Here's our lakeside access road. You get a little railing here, um, little channel. Great to put a water bar across here and send that water into the woods instead of it beating up that driveway over time. Rock infiltration, here's an example of just a French drain kind of scenario. We're just collecting the water off this half of the rooftop and that's maybe a two foot trench by four feet deep lined with the erosion control fabric. Here's another way it could look. This person just did it right off their driveway so they calculated, okay, I have uh, 15 by 40 feet of driveway, this much square footage, I need a four foot pit that's two feet wide uh, and that's uh, dug out of the ground, put erosion control fabric and you're off and running. Here's an example where they brought the water to it. So coming underground here to the pit, this is perforated piping now, the water's released. We fold that erosion control fabric right over the top of that. You can put sod back over the top of that and you're off and running, don't even know it's there. You have a little release pipe here in case you get a big storm event if you have a place for the water to go. And then the fifth one's rain gardens. I call it the twofer. You get habitat through native plants that you're putting in that help pollinators and migratory birds. 
but at the same time, you're diverting water from a downspout, or in this case, a driveway, and it's coming into the rain garden, collects there, and allows the infiltrate back in the ground. Here's an example of one on Beaver Dam Lake. Carol's showing the Healthy Lakes team her fine rain garden. So here's how the grant works. You can either jump in with your local lake group as a sponsor to your, and get $1,000 for any one of these best practices. So the total cost of the project would be $1,333 would be the max. $333 you pay for, $1,000 through the grant. You have two years to put that in the ground. So if you get a bad ice year or you just can't get to the project that first year, you can come back the second year and get it done. We ask that you have a 10-year contract. Contract's kind of a strong word there. It's literally a one-page piece of paper where you write down that you pledge to maintain my native planting for 10 years or my rock infiltration kit for 10 years or whatever it is. Um, and basically, the website has a how-to video on it to walk you through how to put that application together and uh, pointers on how to pull a good application together. There's also a frequently asked question fact sheet that tries to walk you through what are some of the common questions you might have as a landowner uh, looking to do a project like this. To date, we've had uh, something, I think we're up to 550 of these best practices in the first five years, so we're five years into this. Um, and I'm happy to say every grant that has come in so far has been funded. So, so far we've been finding the money um, through the surface water grant program to fund these projects. And like I say, I think this year we had up there on that line 14 applications, 15 counties, 23 different lakes, and some 161 more best practices going into the ground. So where did it find out more information? That's the website uh, welcome page that's on the front of that brochure. They, uh, all the documents I've been talking about are listed there. You can order them and pass them out to your lake groups via that website. Two things, you can either jump in and do the grant through your lake group, or we try to, through that technical information, create a do-it-yourself type possibility, where you can just grab the information, uh, learn about what the best practice is, and off you go doing it yourself. So with that, I thank you for the invitation of being here today. I thank you for what you do to help keep these wonderful lakes in the 14-mile watershed healthy. I hope I've maybe uh, got you to think a little bit about maybe doing another step, maybe jumping into a Healthy Lakes best practice to help with this overall clean water and wildlife challenge. So with that, thank you very much for having me, and I'll be around all day. And have some So uh, one thing I would mention, um, Pat taught Dave Trudeau and me, we went to a workshop up in Tomahawk and actually got certified to help draw up the plans for Healthy Lakes uh, projects. And I'll admit that Dave is a lot better at it than I am. So uh, he's got a table, an exhibit table in the back. Stop and see him. I think we've done eight or ten Healthy Lakes uh, projects in the last two years. Is that right, Dave? Are we? The homeowner's share of the grant can also be labor, which is valued at $12 an hour. Yeah, good point. So that 25% that you have to pay for, you can chip away at that, as Dave says, by putting the plants in the ground, digging the trench for the, the uh, rock infiltration, putting your uh, your antenna ground to work at $12 an hour. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's the point. So that 25% that you have to pay for, you can chip away at that, as Dave says, by putting the plants in the ground, digging the trench for the it's pretty easy to come up with 300 bucks that way if you jump in and help with the project. So, uh, did everybody hear what Dave had to say? Uh, probably you did, because I could kind of hear him up here. So, we're clear on that. Stop and see on us. Stop and see Dave if you back at the exhibit table. Tell you more about it. So, I'm going to talk about the Nike Owen plan, and uh, uh, I will admit that on the brief through these slides, uh, there were uh, there was an hour and a half presentation done for us by Andrew Craig from the DNR. He's the person who, um, I guess he, uh, I'm not sure what to call him, except that he helped Adams County 
uh, and the uh, counties around us to uh, put this plan together and also get it in a, a, a state where it could be presented to the EPA for approval. So he did a fine job. He's a great speaker, and I, I wish he could have been here, but uh, he's busy with something else. So let me talk about this. Uh, what led to this, I guess, really what led to our actions about two years ago in 2016 with the blue green algae. And it was the frustration with the declining lake quality. Um, my wife and I have had property up here about 35 years. I would say the lake water used to be better than it is today. Would you all agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a frustration with that. And so, in my case, you know, I think about children, grandchildren, and I think about how we enjoyed the lake before when it was clear, and the concern I have for allowing my grandchildren to go out in the lake when I know that there might be some risk of blue green algae. That's frightening. So we started this, uh, well, it was going on two and a half years ago. And so we've talked with a lot of people. Uh, we've talked with other lake groups who preceded us, and certainly as, as Patrick and Scott uh, told us, uh, there are other lakes who have the same water quality problems we have. And so they're years down the road from us, and so we can learn from their own experience. And so we talked with them try to find out what solutions might be out there. And what we've learned is that uh, there's not a silver bullet. Uh, we've talked also with consultants, and there are firms out there who are engineering firms who have people on staff who uh, have expertise who will come in and will do it for you, or they tell you that they will do it for you. And uh, most of the experts we've talked to uh, say that really you need to have a hand in the process. And so, as Scott mentioned, there are, uh, there are chemicals, uh, but not chemicals that are really effective in dealing with the issues we have. And there are processes that we've learned about through the Wisconsin Lakes Conference that uh, Patrick uh, talked about, and uh, some of those processes work for different lake types, uh, for contained lakes, but not necessarily for us. So, we've learned a lot. Uh, one thing we do know, and I think we would all be in agreement here, is that Weed cutters are not the answer. We spend a lot of uh, money cutting weeds, but we're cutting a symptom of another problem that we have. Would we all agree with that? Absolutely. So, um, and I don't mean to demean uh, the job that our weed cutters do. They do a great job. And I appreciate colleagues, their effort, and the weed cutters. So, what we've learned is that what we need is a cooperative effort with our upstream uh, neighbors. And uh, Scott mentioned a 50-50 uh, in the... Uh, the $12 million stuff the muck project in the Yahara River that feeds into Madison, uh, they have, uh, they indicate that it's about a 70-30 split. And so uh, they say that about 70% of the issue they're dealing with is coming from upstream, about 30% within the lakes uh, themselves. But I don't know what number is really the right number for us. Uh, what I do know is that we have a hand in this and I think we can be a part of the solution. So here's my definition of the uh, Nakielman plan. It's a very complex uh, process, and you know we've learned a, a lot about it. But I try to put it in my own terms because I'm um, a man. So what what this does for us is that we've had a very active committee. Um, there are about 12 of us on our committee, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we started out as a tri-lakes based committee, and then through the efforts of our, our town board, expanded it to all waters within the town. So there are about 12 or 14 of us on this 14-mile uh, creek watershed committee. And so um, we've got some really hard-working people, and we'll meet some of them back at the exhibit tables. Uh, but you know, we're kind of confined to this town of Rome here. As Scott indicated, our lakes are actually a small piece of this watershed. The watershed is like 90,000 acres and about 38 miles, so there's a lot of other people involved in this. And so the one thing that this Nike Elman plan does for us is it expands our footprint and it really expands uh, all the concerns we feel and the actions we want to take to people all up and down that um, uh, that watershed. And so that's a good thing for us because honestly we can't do it alone. Um, the other thing it does is uh, because we had some really good advisors from Adams County and from the DNR, we started collecting data. We started doing uh, certified testing 
in our soils and our water about two years ago. And that has uh, provided a baseline of information that has actually been put to use for this night tailing plant. So uh, under the advisement of our experts, we did the right thing. Uh, so what this, the other thing it does for us is it adds uh, the involvement of the four other counties. Uh, the person who is managing the writing of the plan is our Adams County Conservationist. And so that plan then gets elevated to the DNR uh, where they help to modify it and massage it. And then they present it to the EPA uh, who does the final approval of it and then grants us the ability to move forward with the plan. Um, so it's an advantage to us to expand our efforts beyond just Adams County to the county conservationists of the four counties around us, also the DNR and also the uh, uh, Wisconsin Mining Water Group. So it's expanded our food footprint, uh, put us in contact with a lot more uh, experienced people who can help us. Um, another key thing is that provides us access to EPA, state, and NRCS and other groups funding. It's an expensive proposition to clean up these uh, lakes, and uh, it's nice to know that we have access to funding. But the other key thing is it provides us uh, access to expertise that we simply don't have here at Salt Lake Street. So here are the counties in the watershed. They're very similar to the, uh, the map that you saw from Scott, so I won't spend much time with it. But, you know, again, on, on the left are our lakes, and then uh, everything else that feeds into us. So we know that um, our watershed is a much larger area than just our lakes. So the important thing about a nine kilometer plant, uh, it's all based upon uh, the, um, uh, the Clean Water Act that I think originated back in the 70s. And uh, it dealt primarily with point source polluters. And a point source polluter versus a non-point would be if I have a factory uh, or let's say I have a mill uh, or a wastewater treatment plant, and I've got a pipe that basically is taking the water that I've processed and then putting it into a water river like the Wisconsin River or Mile Watershed, I can identify that and I can measure it and I can take steps uh, to um, mitigate uh, that pollutant coming out. But then there's this class of things called non-point sources. Non-point sources would be those of us on a lake. We can't really measure what our impact is directly. You can't measure what agriculture's uh, effort is directly. And uh, Scott mentioned that we're doing water testing, and so it's allowing us to kind of home in on, on some of the areas where we see some higher readings. But you can't just go to one field, typically, on well, one farm, and you know, measure all of the uh, uh, comments. So that's a category uh, called <coughs> source. And so they created section 319 to deal with uh, lakes and egg and other non-point polluters. And the EPA has set aside $4 million for Section 19 for the state of Wisconsin. In total, I'm not sure what the number is, but there's a lot of money uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, being put into non-point uh, areas. So for us, there's the $4 million. Uh, part of it is for um, education programs, but half of it is for like us and watersheds like us who are trying to uh, eliminate uh, some of the sources of pollution. So there's money uh, to operate with out there. Uh, so what are they? Uh, the goal of the 9 kilometer plan is to restore the impaired waters in our case, in its surface and or groundwater. And as Scott mentioned, ours is the first uh, 9 kilometer plan to include both groundwater and surface water. And um, so it, it wants, it seeks to restore our water our watershed back to what it used to be, quality of what it used to be. Uh, but it's also a framework that uses existing programs and basically coordinates it. And um, so there are things like our lake management plans, like our, our county land and water plans, uh, farmland preservation uh, ordinances and, and plans. Uh, NR 151 is our shoreland uh, protection ordinance that you might remember from a few years ago county ordinances, and then grants <coughs> at the state and federal level and for targeted runoff, uh, discharge, cost sharing, uh, lakes programs. And so there's money out there not only to help with um, uh, steps that we need to take uh, to minimize our own impact on our lakes, but also uh, there are programs out there to assist agriculture to do the same. So what are the elements? Uh, is, you know, any of you who have done project management, if you 
going to recognize uh, steps first. You have to identify the causes and sources. Then you have to describe the management measures that need to be implemented in order to achieve load reductions. And so the DNR and uh, EPA use terms like load reduction to represent uh, things like the total maximum daily load, which is the allowable, allowable amount of the uh, nutrients that are coming into the water basin. And then um, the third step is to estimate the uh, watershed pollutant loads and load uh, reductions from management measures. And um, I said, I think uh, Dr. Paul McGinley from UW Stevens Point, I think he's here today, he told me he was going to be here. I sat through on a uh, training program with him, with him uh, where he talked about some of these programs, and I was blown away by the complexity of it. A lot of algorithms and very complex uh, programs that help to estimate uh, not only the amount of pollutant, but also what can be minimized in certain steps. And then estimate the, the amounts of um, technical and financial help needed in order to implement this plan. Uh, and then there's, uh, in the plan, there's a, uh, an educational portion of it. Uh, we need to educate uh, uh, people like us and also our upstream neighbors. There are probably about 150 or so of us here today. There are 1,800 properties on our lakes. And so we have a lot of educating to do. Um, and then it's to uh, set up a schedule uh, for implementing the management measure. And uh, this program, this 90 element plan, covers 10 years. And uh, there are steps within those 10 years that bring it into milestones, which um, are year one to three, year four to uh, seven, or four to six, and seven to 10. And then uh, they have, uh, if you will, checkpoints uh, that said, what are the the measurable milestones, how do we determine uh, that we are on track with this? You don't want to wait until year 10 uh, to determine whether or not you've been successful in the measure all through the process, right? It just makes sense. And then a set of criteria to determine if the reductions are being uh, um, obtained over term. And then a monitoring component. And uh, EPA and others who grant those funds then need to come in and monitor to make sure that the right things are happening. And they uh, do that um, by integrating with the schedule and milestones. So uh, just to give you a little background, and I'll try and speed through this because I've got like two minutes. But uh, in November of 2017, our then county conservationist suggested we do this. And they said this, uh, this is a very complex scenario, but it's really the only identifiable solution. And so we said, yeah, let's, let's uh, do this. So they began that in no November 2017 uh, through March 2019, which we're putting the plan together uh, with all four county conservationists, uh, with the DNR and Wisconsin Land and Water. It was presented to us on the uh, on middle of April. And so we had our 14-mile uh, Creek Watershed Committee, uh, Town Board, and our Travis Board attendance at that presentation where we learned what some of these steps were. Um, and it's now being uh, submitted for uh, uh, review by the DNR. So uh, as mentioned, I won't spend too much time here because you've heard this, but it's a 38-mile watershed of about 90,000 acres. Um, so the overall goal is uh, better identify the groundwater pollution sources and work to improve groundwater quality by reducing phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, improving uh, the lake and stream back, uh, stability as, as Patrick spent some time talking to us about. And then increasing the uh, awareness of it. You know, we need to know what effect we're having on our lake by the steps that we've taken. Ten-year schedule. Uh, I'm going to skip through this because I have little time left. But I, I want to talk a little bit about land use. Uh, we're on the left-hand side. You can see our lake surrounded by green, which represents forest. Uh, the yellow portion of that is agriculture. So we know that there's a lot of agriculture upstream. Uh, they have an impact on what we do. Um, and some of that uh, agriculture is uh, irrigation. So each one of those little uh, circles or uh, uh, rectangular or square areas are uh, high capacity wells that are drawing from the water table. And then uh, septic systems, as Scott mentioned, we need to be aware that septic systems also have an impact 
Uh, Wood County is in the upper left. Those are the red dots. Each dot is a septic system. On the right side is Portage County. Fairly rural in that area, so you don't see a lot of septic systems. The far right in blue is Washera County. Uh, and there are, again, a fairly uh, rural area without a lot of septic systems. But if you look on the left where the purple is, uh, that's our, our lake country here. And so we know that with 1,800 properties around the lakes, we know we've got a fair number of septic systems. What we don't know right now is what is the impact of that. And so some of the testing that's going on uh, is to really try to identify that. So not more to uh, say about that, except that's part of the overall plan is to check it. So we know there's been significant changes in the watershed over the past 20 years, and we talked about that. Um, we're, and as Scott mentioned, we're at significant risk for nitrogen loss below the root zone, and uh, that's because of what we're doing here. While we wait for approval, we continue with our programs. Uh, we have a very aggressive water testing, soil testing program here. We're worried about that. Uh, and we need to start building relationships with our county conservation and with the people upstream from us. So, plan cost is about eight million dollars over ten years. About four million for to shore up uh, agriculture and the practices that they follow and uh, mitigation practices for them. About two million in our lake shores, including things like you know, I live on Lake Camelot. And I know that the thirty some uh, beach clubs on Camelot are in terrible shape. We get a lot of uh, uh, runoff and also uh, um, ground or uh, uh, erosion from them. So I want to give you uh, some milestone examples. I need to open that up. And we're about two minutes from being done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This didn't carry over too well to my uh, uh, PowerPoint, but um, this gives an example. Uh, these are uh, Lakeshore Milestone, uh, and it's, uh, so if, if you look at the uh, categories, it's an objective, the indicators, uh, and then uh, what the counts would be, or the numbers, uh, values would be over the years. Who pays for it, and then who's responsible for it? So in our own lake shores, as an example, stabilizing banks and doing some of the native uh, plantings that uh, Patrick told us about are important to uh, improving our uh, impact. Okay, so we're getting the water. What I wanted to show you is that uh, the whisper in the culture is probably about two pages. And uh, there are things like uh, improving the uh, doing crop rotations. Oh, sorry. Um, doing crop rotations, improving uh, stream banks, uh, changing the things that they grow, uh, in increasing the setbacks from uh, stream banks. Uh, if you've driven along Highway D, you see that uh, with the raising cattle, uh, the fence line is about five feet from the, uh, the ditch line. So it's an improving conditions like that. So with that, I'm going to close because I know Scott Krug has got a message for us. So. Thank you all. So, a lot of good information, and I want to be quick because I'm the thing standing between you at lunch, and that is the last thing that an elected official wants to do, is stand between his constituents and a good meal. So I will make it really quick. A lot of the things that have been talked about tonight fit in really well, or this morning I should say, a lot of those things fit in really well with existing programs, that we fund through the DNR, that yes, we get a lot of those dollars from the EPA to filter through DNR back to our local counties. Now, one of the things in particular I wanted to talk about was the uh, county conservation funding, making sure that we have staff in our counties, especially in our smaller counties, uh, that can work with uh, folks in watersheds, that can work with egg producers, that can work with so many different stakeholders. Uh, we've been doing really good the last two state budgets and uh, funding county conservation positions. This upcoming budget that Joint Finance is discussing right now, uh, we're also increasing funding for county conservation officers again. So we're adding another $2 million over the next two years to add more positions for county conservation officers. 
that the state will fund that will come out of the tax base for you, so you've got more tax dollars within your counties uh, to do some more things on top of that. Uh, you know, when I mention that a little bit, I want you to remember that as you look at your property tax bill, you've got many entities that can be doing a lot of these things already. They're starting to take some of those things to heart and doing them. So, for example, the town of Rome is doing a lot of stuff with your tax dollars to help fund the 14-mile group to make sure that they're doing things that are on the ground, to get volunteers out, to collect data, to get information back to the NR, which in the end is saving you some tax dollars to do that. The county taking some of the dollars from the EPA and the state for getting out working with egg producers to create programs, to do offsets, to do buffer zones, to do no-till, to do all of these different things, to reduce nutrients into your groundwater. One of the other big investments we just made in the state budget that will be voted out in the next few weeks, the Joint Finance Committee added $12.5 million in the SAG Environmental Fund. The SAG Environmental Fund covers tons of little programs. It, it, it covers the, the Healthy Lakes, it covers a lot of the stuff that, that Scott Provost and his, his colleagues work on. So we're making sure that you have more of those boots on the ground again. That $12.5 million is almost exactly what the governor had asked for. And one of the features of the state budget that's pretty unique this time is that when Governor Evers talks about 2019 being the year of water quality, we've also got the Speaker's Water Quality Task Force. Basically, when Governor Evers submitted his budget for environmental issues for the Joint Finance Committee to consider, it basically came out unscathed on the other end. It's basically almost the same amount of funding. A lot of those programs stayed intact. Uh, nothing was cut. Nothing was really removed. There were some changes in some money, but all the programs survived. Even some of the programs that are really important to us, like the lake and, lake and river protection grants that are in the state budget, uh, weren't even debated at joint time. It just passed right through, uh, made it no problem. So my message to you today is as we're talking about funding for these things, I need you to reach out to your state representatives, where you're from originally, or unless you're from here, to get a hold of me. Talk to them about making sure that those dollars stay in the state budget need you to make sure that you are taking time to either email or call the governor's office to make sure that there's not going to be a veto of the entire state budget, which we've heard about. The challenge we have is if there's a veto of the state budget, these funding sources disappear. They're not going to pull through into the next two years. They're not going to be increased over what they were two years ago. Wisconsin state budget, if we don't have one new, newly passed, maintains at the previous levels that it was at. And those levels are not adequate for the funding that we need for the next five years for this area, especially with all the momentum we're seeing. We're also making sure we're investing in the uh, projects, you know, the nine Kelvin plants we also pay for through the state from the EPA, as Don had mentioned. Uh, we need to start doing more of the implementation of those. So we've tried to take a meeting with the stakeholders here in the last few weeks, take those uh, plans for the next few years and fit them into programs and to make sure that we funded those programs. So I did eight budget motions to the Joint Finance Committee to make sure we've got dollars coming in for parts of the nine key element plans so we can cover those. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention as my last one, the producer-led watershed program. Uh, this program is probably the most successful program that we can utilize to help build that cooperation between upstream agriculture folks who have concerns around the lake. So what that program does, and we've been increasing funding every year, and this budget will be no different, increased funding for it again this budget. It takes those dollars, puts them with county conservation folks to be able to go out and talk to egg producers throughout the entire watershed, to offer them cost, or uh, to offer a match on their cost of implementing some of these programs, and setbacks and changes to their operations. It's been hugely successful. We've got 38 different programs around the state that are part of the producer-led program and dozens more wanting to be involved in this. That cooperation and that buy-in is the only way you're going to get any solutions to actually become implemented. Because if there's no buy-in from agriculture, if they continue to feel attacked and not part of the process, they're not going to be inclined to help. That's something that we've really tackled the last couple of years here and I give a lot of credit to the 14 Mile Group for getting to the point where they're ready out from the plan, they've got something ready to approach egg producers up the upstream area here in the rest of the watershed. So my job this budget has been to try to make sure that we can fund that next step. And I take that next step really seriously because it reminds me a lot of what we did with the Packers group and the Seabrook back there. This is, this is all the same process we did with the Packers on Castle Rock and, and uh, Pete and Well and the rest of the Wisconsin River system for the TMDL. <laughs> Uh, we've gone through 10, 12 years now of work trying to make sure that, that process has been funded, analyzed, implemented. We're finally at the stage of implementation. We've put 
positions now into our state budget to implement it all up and down the entire Wisconsin water rivershed or permits for everybody who introduces nutrients to that system. That process is the biggest TMDL that's ever been done in the country. Uh, that's what I want to see done individually here with our nine calendar plans across the area and across the state of Wisconsin. Implement the, the implementation dollars are key. Uh, so like I said, if you're not originally in here, if you're not a full-time in here, make sure you talk to your state representative in the next couple weeks and tell them to make sure that the funding that was approved by Joint Finance stays in the budget uh, for environmental quality issues. It's been a really big significant increase. I think overall we're talking $40 million towards the priorities that we're talking about for these types of projects statewide that will come here and start you know, being started part of the solution. So again, I think you know it's 1230-ish, so I'm going to you know, take a Take the end here and just call it a day. Reach out to me anytime. Full time, part time, whether you're here all the time or not. Sign up for our e-updates. Make sure you get, you know, give me a call, send me an email. Just reach out to us because the more input I get from you, the stronger my voice is in the rest of my caucus to get things done. So have a good lunch and we'll talk to you soon. So uh, I have one thing to say and then I want to uh, introduce John and Dreezy. Um, there are about 150 of us here. There are about 1,800 property owners uh, are on our lakes. We need to get the message out. And if you believe in uh, the Clean Water Cooperator Program, you know, if you're willing to sign up for a reasonable fertilizer schedule, or even like Todd Manthe from Lake Camelot, who suggested we ought to put those stickers on for people who don't fertilize at all. We've got about 30 of those signs uh, sitting back at one of the tables. And the ability for you to sign up to get one, uh, please do that. Get the message out. The more of these signs we see around our properties, the stronger the message is. So, uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, John and Bruce. I asked him to kind of wrap things up, but um, I want you to meet um, what he does. What he does is really, uh, it's beyond, uh, beyond expectation. John is our water test guy. Uh, he works with an intern uh, named. Uh, Nick at China, I'm not sure if he's here today. But uh, John goes out and tests the water on a monthly basis. So for the past 18 months, John has been out there testing in 11 different locations, regardless of weather, uh, to get us uh, good, solid testing information. And uh, as Scott indicated, John is using some very sophisticated equipment. Uh, he uh, uses UWSP as a certified testing facility. And he has given us two years, nearly two years of evidence that has allowed us really to be credible enough to have the EPA grant us this night out of time. So, Thanks, Don. Um, I'm the face in the water. There's no doubt about that. Um, I've uh, got my invitation to call our water through uh, the Ojibwe tribes of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, one of their uh, guiding lights, as it were, for their livelihood is to think about water in a fashion where you look at it uh, in the future. You not only drink your water now, but you have children and grandchildren that are going to need to do the same, and you treat it in that, in that fashion. They, they, they do their things in relation to seven generations hence. And I found that to be a very, very interesting and properly guiding philosophy. So uh, with that, uh, I got involved with the, uh, with the 14-mile watershed committee. I was uh, one of the, the first people uh, to approach, uh, along with Mr. Eastead, uh, our uh, Tri Lakes Management Group for our start. Uh, the town came in shortly thereafter, and we have this joint committee. It's, it's worked so well uh, thus far. Uh, I, I know that you've heard a lot from a number of people today regarding the water, regarding what's happening. So I'm not going to bore you with, and, and not that it's boring by any means, stretch of the imagination, but I'm, I'm not going to do much more of that telling to you. I think maybe it's time that you've heard enough where you might have some questions in your own mind. And to that end, uh, during our lunchtime, I would encourage you to, uh, I'm going to have the microphone here, and I would encourage you to ask questions to presenters and others of us on 14 Mile Watershed Committee, uh, anything that you might uh, have heard or want to hear about relating to the situations that we told you about today. 
uh, as far as a couple little announcements here, uh, we gave you a, a raffle ticket uh, when you walked in the door. Uh, there are numerous prizes, cash and otherwise, uh, uh, to be won at uh, 115. So we're going to draw at that point in time. So during your uh, lunch hour, uh, I would uh, suggest that you might want to circulate and meet some of uh, our other representatives, uh, both from the state and from private enterprise, uh, who are out in the hallway and in the town boardroom. Uh, a couple of those uh, tables have extra tickets for you. So uh, if you were to uh, volunteer for uh, continued soil testing, not continued, but an individual soil test, which will uh, give you results uh, relating to the elements that are present in your soil, uh, give you a, a, an overview of what you have, what you might want to do as far as the management of your soils, uh, stop by the soil testing booth, you'll get an extra ticket for signing up. Uh, we're going to come around and uh, uh, please leave your phone number uh, when you sign up so that we can give you a call and make sure that you're home when we, we come by. Uh, it's it, uh, obviously not appropriate for me to come into your yard and start poking in your soil if you're not there. Uh, I, I, not that I'm going to uncover anything that I don't want to, but it's not right, so please do that. Uh, the, the Healthy Lakes uh, booth also has tickets. And uh, the 14-mile uh, watershed committee, uh, joint committee, uh, has a new uh, Facebook presence. And to that end, uh, if you've already found us on Facebook and show uh, the person at the booth your like for that Facebook site, another ticket. So enough to say with all of that, I guess. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the booth is just about ready, so you might want to uh, circulate and uh, get your plate full, and then uh, again, I'll have the, the mic here available. So um, if you have questions, uh, I'll be happy to uh, guide them to a person who can answer for you. So let's have at it.